So I want to say to everyone, Shalom, and welcome to the third and final program of a special three-part talking memory series, Invisible Years. In today's program will focus on moving memories. My name is Medin Shahar, and I work at the Ghetto Fighters House as an educator and a guide. I want to welcome our global audience, including friends and colleagues from Holocaust museums, institutions, and centers, Jewish heritage institutions, academics, and students from universities, historians, and our many friends who attend our Talking Memory series. A special welcome to the survivors and their families that are with us today, especially the Bizote descendants and their families. We want to thank everyone for their support and interest in our programs. Today's program is in partnership with our friends at the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in South Africa, Classrooms Without Borders, and the Rabin Forum Chair at George Washington University. And, and before starting today's program, I want to wish all those who celebrate a happy Hanukkah, as this is the last night when we light all eight candles that symbolize the number of days that the temple lantern blazed, the ninth candle, the Shamash, is a helper candle used to light the others. We know that during the Holocaust, many Jews tried to celebrate the Jewish holidays in secret. And in the waiting room, you saw a picture from our Holland archives that was taken in Westerbork in December, 1943. This picture, I was to learn after posting it on our Facebook page a few years ago, was connected to a dear friend of mine whose mother and aunt are in the picture. And actually in a series of pictures, uh, her aunt is actually lighting the candles on the seventh night of Hanukkah. Having no keepsakes or art of Ju Judaic artifacts to hand down from generation to generation, this family portrait became an heirloom, symbolizing a family's spiritual resistance. And for my friend, that sense of resilience is what she had passed on to her children, and they will pass it on to the generations to follow. This is their legacy and is our moral obligation to preserve, remember, and continue to tell these inspirational stories. So Chag Sameach. I now would like to give the floor to Daphne Geisner, whose incredible memoir, Invisible Years, a family's collected account of separation and survival during the Holocaust in the Netherlands was the inspiration for the Invisible Years series. Daphne? Thank you, Medin. <clears throat> Today, hello everyone. It's nice to see so many familiar faces um, and to be here with um, Barbara and three incredible filmmakers. Today is the third and final session of the Ghetto Fighters House Museum series inspired by my book, Invisible Years, that weaves together my family members' stories about their experiences under German occupation <clears throat> in the Netherlands. No one person had the complete story, but their collective accounts make it whole. The Ghetto Fighters House is an ideal partner because of their special relationship with the Netherlands. They have a permanent exhibition titled The Jews of Holland During the Holocaust and a temporary exhibition that's up now on the 19,000 Jewish, Roma and Sinti children who were deported from the Netherlands. <clears throat> I would like to thank Maydeen Shachar, the director of this Talking Memory Program for collaborating with us on this series. Medine engaged a remarkable group of presenters with a large audience, as you can see from all over the world for all three sessions. This series wouldn't have been possible without Medine's dedication and the commitment of our four fellow conspirators, Sharon Strauss, Hadassah Lulav, and Ronit Lesky. We're grateful to Yigal Cohen, the director of the museum, for supporting our ideas, and we appreciate the support of the series partners. Nadine mentioned them, I'm gonna mention them, get them again because they've been terrific. The South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, Rabin Chair Forum, and Classrooms Without Borders. We're incredibly honored that this series opened with inspiring remarks from Hans Doctor, the ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. He's been an advocate of invisible years and a believer in bringing people together to learn from one another. In session one, my cousin Sharon Strauss and I shared the stories of our parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles under Nazi occupation and in hiding. We had the privilege of presenting with the distinguished Holocaust historian, Robert Jan van Pelt, who provided a historical framework to our family's history. In session two, 
Mayor Abu Talib of Rotterdam explained the significance of the events that took place in Rotterdam's Brightplain Church. Two Christian families had three Jewish couples, including my grandparents. The mayor concluded that learning this history helps us understand the importance of helping vulnerable people today with reference to refugees throughout the world. The mayor was followed by Dinka Hondius. She presented her work mapping the places where Jews were hidden, including the 27 hiding addresses of my family members. Then Kina Brillenberg Wirth took us back to the Bride Plain Church where her grandparents saved my grandparents to unpack the sermon that her grandfather delivered the day after liberation. It revealed his contradictory thoughts on saving Jews and the precarity of the three Jewish couples in hiding. I'm grateful for all of these brilliant contributions. If you missed the first two sessions, recordings are available on the Ghetto Fighters House YouTube channel. We'll put a link to these in the chat. <clears throat> Now, I'm very excited about tonight's program moderated by Barbara kirschenblatt Gimblet. She will be talking with three filmmakers. Carmen Fernald is making a documentary about the protectors and the people they hid in the Bright Plain Church. Kira Dane and Caitlin Ribello are creating an experimental documentary short adapted from Invisible Years. I'm grateful that these talented women are exploring new ways to engage young people in this history. I'm inspired by the humanity and teachings of everyone involved in this series, including my family members who speak from the pages of my book. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's program and the three young filmmakers that Daphne uh, just mentioned. Daphne will also be joining the conversation. It is truly an honor to have Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet facilitating this talk today. She is Professor Amrita at New York University and the Ronald S. Lauder's Chief Curator of the Core Exhibition Polin Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw. And now the filmmakers. Carmen Fernald is a journalist and documentary filmmaker from the Netherlands. She created and researched the series Farewell Netherlands for public broadcasting about Netherlanders who emigrated after the Second World War. Kira Dane is a half Japanese and half American filmmaker from New York, currently based in Nara, Japan. And she is coming to us in the middle of the night. So thank you so much, Kira. Having been shaped and informed by two very different cultures, she's most interested in telling documentary stories that use animation and experimental forms to dig for nuance. Kira was a 2019 fellow of the Sundance Ignite program. And Caitlin Ribello is a filmmaker based in Brooklyn. Her work combines nonfiction and experimental forms, often exploring stories that reimagine concepts of femininity, memory, and personal freedom. She is currently a creative culture filmmaker fellow at Jacob Berms Film Center. And finally, Barbara, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you very much, uh, Maydeen. I think that this is a very appropriate way to, um, as a kind of culmination for the three sessions that are dedicated to Invisible Years. And I want to thank Daphne for the inspiration uh, for the book and for the series and for these two films. It's a very extraordinary book and it's a very unusual book. And I think that uh, Daphne's opening comment but these are individual stories. Each is a piece of a bigger story, but together they actually paint a picture. And I would agree with her that one of the most compelling ways to communicate what it is that, that, that we feel is most important about the Holocaust is through these small stories, stories of individuals, and uh, that they, together, they, they, they do, they are pieces of a much, much bigger picture. But tell me the big story, to those small stories uh, is very, very powerful. It's also, uh, I think, the precondition for making compelling films. And there have been, there are many ways in which the Holocaust uh, has been presented, is being presented, whether through museums, through books, films, video, um, any number of ways. And today we're going to be exploring two different approaches to the film, to, to film it, to a film based on this book. 
Now, what's fascinating for me is that in a way, the, the book itself has the quality of a play script. And I think Daphne actually says as much in, uh, in what she has written. It's a very unusual situation. And that is that um, there are these individuals, but there are, there's all this archival material. And the approach to the book is experimental. This is not a conventional uh, book in the sense that it's primarily text with some illustrations and that it starts at the beginning and it moves chronologically to the end. It's rather organized around these individuals and it is also experimental as a book in terms of its graphic treatment, its format. It's, it's really, it's an object and not simply, uh, not simply a book. So I, I think that in that way, both its content, its story, but also its format and the way that Daphne has conceptualized it really not only lends itself, but begs for filmic treatment. Now, um, we're gonna be exploring two very, very different approaches to film inspired by the book. And uh, we're gonna start by inviting Carmen to present her film project which focuses on a place of hiding, that is the starting point, um, and it is intended for public television and to reach a very, very broad audience. And it'll be quite different from what we'll be exploring in Caitlin and Kira's uh, exper short experimental film. So the, I think the uh, being able to talk about these two films, which are works in progress, so we're gonna be able to explore the process of making them and their relationship to, to the book and all that the book is based on. So Carmen, um, I, I would like to invite you to present your project. Thank you very much, Barbara, for this uh, beautiful introduction. I will share my screen. Yes. As Barbara told you, I'm an editor-in-chief in Holland and a documentary and, uh, filmmaker for Dutch public television. Before I'm going to tell you more about uh, the documentary I want to make uh, on the Breitplein Bre Kerk, I want to show you a fragment of a series I made earlier for, for Omroep Max. Um, it's a series, Farewell Nederland. Farewell. Oh, I want to. Just, yeah. Farewell the Netherlands. Uh, a series on Dutch people who emigrated after World War II uh, to the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. After the war, uh, a lot of people in Holland um, didn't see any future in Holland. So um, they wanted to leave their country. They also got stimulated with, uh, by the Dutch government. government. And uh, a large of that people emigrated to Canada, as I told you, Australia and the United States. And I was curious how these gener generation look back on this big step, but also what the motivations were so I got in contact with um, Betty Knoop. Betty Knoop is a remarkable woman. Uh, she was born in Amsterdam and she survived Bergen, the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. After her return to the Netherlands, she really felt displaced here. And in America, she visits schools to tell her story and we can see a little fragment of um, the interview we made uh, in, in uh, the United States. Before I start telling you my story, right. I am here indeed to tell you what happened to me as a Jewish child in the Netherlands when the German occupation took place. But I really speak for 6 million people and 1,500,000 of those were children under the age of 15. And I came very close to being one of them. But let's go into my story. How is it possible that we are alive and out? That was 
onvoorstelbaar. Al voor was wat heel erg. Liberated, het was een miracle. On the 26th of April, however, my mom died during the night. She knew her children were liberated. She knew maybe that we would have a chance. I guess she couldn't cope any longer. She had been a very young woman. She had been 36 years old. And I have missed her every day of my life. Kom daar nooit overheen. Daar kom je nooit en nooit en nimmer overheen. Na de bevrijding keert Betty samen met haar vader en haar broertje terug naar Amsterdam. Maar de stad is niet meer wat het geweest is. Dat is een dode stad. Dat is onvoorstelbaar vandaag. Het was painful. It still is painful. I can go come in areas. I know daar woonde mijn oma en daar woonde mijn tante. En daar hebben wij gewoond. Daar ben ik op school gegaan. Maar het dat is pijnvol, dat, dat is weggerukt van. Dat, dat, dat is vermoord. Alhoewel Betty zich totaal niet thuis voelt in Amsterdam, haalt ze nog wel haar HBS-diploma. Maar zodra het kan, wil ze weg. Het land uit. Mijn moeder die had gezegd, dan kun je naar mijn broer naar Amerika toe. Dus die heeft, eigenlijk had mijn moeder me dat al in mijn hoofd gesproken. En toen, uh, thank you mam. Via bekenden en familie lukt het om een tijdelijk visum te regelen. Toen ik Hoek van Holland voorbij ging, toen zei ik, dag Nederland, ik kom hier nooit meer wonen. Um, I think it's a very uh, powerful thing that Betty tells her story to young people, young students in America, although it's very painful for her. And that's why um, it was really uh, special to make this portrait of her. I was born in Rotterdam and by chance, I came across the story about the people who were, went into hiding in the Breplein Kerk. It's a very unknown story in the Netherlands. Um, and the circumstances of the people who, who went into hiding uh, and had to survive were very tough. Can you imagine being for 34 months in a, a small space with no daylight? It was very cold in the winter and very hot in summer. And then also um, the uncertainties of the um, uh, fate of your loved ones, because yeah, it was, you didn't know uh, how, how it was with your loved ones. And it's a wonder that the families weren't betrayed. Thanks to the protection, of the um, referent, Mr. Brillenburg, but also of the sextant of the church and a couple of church members. The three couples who were in hiding in the church managed to survive. And for me, this is a, really a history of um, courage, resistance, but also of hope. Because during uh, the winter of 1944, in Holland we call it the hunger winter, the hunger winter, a child was born in this church in hiding. Um, most stories 
about uh, World War II ends with the liberation. After five hard years, the Netherlands was finally free and the focus is on the future. Shortly after the war in Holland, there was no attention for the stories of the people who survived the Holocaust. And therefore, I think the story of the organ loss is uh, really an example of a forgotten story. It took more than 60 years before we learned about the people who were hiding in the church. On one day in 2006, the sextant, who's really, uh, 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 who is uh, right now also the sextant of the, uh, sextant of the church, Cornelis van der Plicht, and the church members, Henk Den Haan and Paul Lettery opened the hatch behind the organs. And to their surprise, they found things from the people in hiding. They found clothing, a pack of matches, and an empty pack of tranquilizers, all silent witnesses. And together with historians uh, and people from the church, Anja Matzer did a remarkable job reconstructing uh, um, the story of the people who went into hiding in the organ loves. And also so I told you uh, that it was very, uh, in, in 2006, after 60 years when the war was ended, these three people, uh, Henk den Haan, uh, Paul Lettery, and uh, Cornelis van der Plicht, opened the hatch behind the organ and found all those things from the people who uh, went hiding all those silent witnesses. And then Anja Matzer reconstructed the story for the Dutch publication, The Orgelsolders, and there's also a, 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 an English translation of the book. But also Daphne did a remarkable job with her book, Invisible Years. For me, it's difficult to say what the documentary will look like, because we're now uh, still in the phase of script writing and research. And it's going to be 50 minutes. It's going to be broadcasted next uh, uh, November in 20, 2022, this next year. But there are a couple of questions that I wanted to be answered. Why has this history remained um, unknown for so long? How was it possible that the people who could survive under such, such harsh conditions and that they haven't been betrayed? And why is this story important for today? I think that many of you haven't uh, visited the Breplein care, uh, Church in uh, Rotterdam. But uh, if you have the chance, it's, it's, worth, it's really worth it to do so. The church is located in a neighborhood in Rotterdam where many people, of people with many cultural backgrounds, people from different cultures are living together. And um, yeah, it is important that also young generations continue to hear about the war and its consequences. My old headmaster of the secondary school, Henk den Haan, um, he gave lectures to uh, students in the church. And um, well, it's, I think this is a very important thing to um, bring the history closer to people, uh, to younger people. Especially in this time, when people and opinions are sometimes radically opposed to each other, I think it's important to tell the story of the victims of the Second World War, because we quickly forget. Every week in Holland, there are demonstrations against the corona measures. And during this protest, 
unjust and shameful comparisons are made uh, with the situations of the Jews in the Second World War. I find it disgraceful, disrespectful and distasteful. Some people in Holland feel discriminated against and is, uh, excluded because they are not vaccinated, but being excluded, locked up and killed because just because you are Jewish is not a choice. It is a crime that we, I think we really must be aware of this day. And that's, yeah, that's really is my motivation to tell these stories, to show what it can lead to when groups in society are excluded. But I also want to be this documentary, um, a story of hope and inspiration because the people in hiding survived thanks to the courage of the people who stood up for them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Carmen. Um, I think this is going to be a very inspiring film and I'm sure that it is going to address precisely the goals that you've outlined. And what I'd like to do now is to turn to Caitlin and Kira, and then I have some questions for all the filmmakers. I'm gonna, hi. hi. <laughs> Daphne, did you want to say a few words first or? Yeah, I'll jump in and just give a little bit of background about the book um, that relates to your film and then the floor is yours. <clears throat> <clears throat> so Kara and Caitlin will be on after I give a very brief presentation. Um, they're going to be telling you about um, the concept for their adaptation of Invisible Years. And I'm just doing a very short overview of the book that we presented in depth in the October session of this series. This is going to be a quick review for those who were there and um, filling in new viewers. <clears throat> These are my family members who became the eight narrators of Invisible Years. In the top row are my grandparents who were in their early 40s when the Germans you're occupied not seeing, the Netherlands. You're not, you're not no. seeing the screen. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Okay, I hope, I think you can see it now. <laughs> In the top row are my family member, or are my um, grandparents who were in their early forties when the Germans occupied the Netherlands. And in the bottom row, my mother, father, aunt and uncle who were children when the war started and teenagers when it ended. On the bottom left is my mother, Miriam Dezuta with her family. On the bottom center is my father, David Geismar, with his father. And on the bottom right is my uncle, Natan Cohen. And um, just to reiterate, these are the eight narrators of our book, the book and the film, in Karen Caitlin's film. These are some of the diaries, letters, and artifacts that the eight narrators left us. Our family story was a puzzle that had to be pieced together. After 14 years of translations, research, writing, editing, designing, and producing, as well as extraordinary collaborations, we had a book. Two esteemed authors did a beautiful job of describing this very hard to describe narrative. Roberta Silman wrote, the book takes the form of a play rather than straight prose, but the narrative has the feel of a tapestry which slowly makes sense as seemingly unconnected threads come together in a wonderfully unexpected way. And in the words of Chaya Palak, full disclosure, she's my mother's cousin, the canon of voices, young and older, each of them telling in their own way, form together an evocative, full and varied image of what the war did to the Jewish people 
and what the Shoah did to mankind. Here you can see a spread from the book with the interwoven voices. In this chapter titled Forbidden, they collectively explain how they slowly lost their property, rights, and freedom. These abbreviated excerpts from the narrative give um, just a little sense of what the narrative is like. Chaim, do something, I said to myself after I was discharged from my job because of an anti-Jewish decree. David, why are we losing everything when we are no different from our friends who aren't Jewish? Hadassah, I understood that being Jewish was walking around with a yellow star of David. Before that, we had no awareness of Jewishness. Miriam, it's terrible when you are told, there goes this person with the star, don't associate with her. It makes you feel like you are nothing. Natan, a Jew could not visit a Gentile friend at his house. Hank and I still went to each other's houses, though this was forbidden. And Judith, day by day, fewer kids came to school. They were caught by the Germans or had gone to the train station as they were told to do by the Dutch authorities or had gone into hiding with the help of the underground. In the first four chapters of the book, family members jointly tell about life before the war, the occupations, restrictions, and plans to go into hiding. For me, hearing these multiple witnesses telling different parts of the same story make it real. I finally understand how extreme racist policies turn society from normal to precarious, and how my family members felt when they lost their human rights and identity. This is the map that opens the hiding section with a key to each person's protectors and hiding places. In the first year, there was a lot of moving around. So there are 27 addresses for the eight people. My maternal grandparents, Fifi and Chaim, were hidden in the attic of the church that uh, Carmen just talked about. My paternal grandfather, Erwin, was in a friend's apartment. There were Nazi raids on both spaces. Fifi and Chaim weren't discovered. Tragically, Erwin was. <clears throat> Among the five children, some could never leave the house. Others hid in plain sight as non-Jews and even went to school. My mother had to sleep in a crawl space under the kitchen floor every night for two years. A few of the protectors were remarkable humanitarians involved in a variety of resistance activities and adventurous escapades. <clears throat> One hiding what parent was, believe it or not, a Nazi sympathizer. And tragically, one hiding father and two of his sons were perpetrators of child sexual abuse. When parents and children separate and go into hiding, they're isolated from the world and from one another. So in the hiding chapter of my book, their voices are no longer interwoven. Each narrator has a separate hiding chapter. In the book, we hear about each unique hiding experience in great detail. <clears throat> when the Netherlands is liberated and the narrators come out of hiding, their voices join together again for the chapter titled After. The Jews, the Roma, the disabled, homosexuals, and political enemies of the regime were persecuted by the Nazis. My family members tell about losing their dignity, being separated from one another, losing their jobs, schools, homes, cultures, and countries. Their friends and relatives were murdered. They were helped and saved by friends and strangers. Understanding what happened to them and millions of others allows me to better understand what is happening in the world today. I'm delighted that so many people have come together to make these stories accessible. Together, we're fulfilling the hope of my grandfather, Erwin, who wrote a 49 page memoir in hiding before he was murdered in Auschwitz. That includes these words. In the end, I hope that my lines will be read by people who will see how we struggled under terrible circumstances and that the reader will want to take up the struggle that we have fought and experienced from the front lines for the construction of a worthwhile, humane society. Now, Kira and Caitlin are going to talk to you about how we've shared all of this information and what they're doing to take this into their film. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kira Dang. Thank you, Daphne, for 
um, providing that great sort of introduction. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit first about um, a short film that me and Caitlin Rebello made together this past year. Um, the two of us want to make a short documentary based on Daphne's book that uses animation and sort of experimental filmmaking forms. Um, and to give you a sort of a better sense of what that might look like, we want to show um, a, clip, a trailer for a film Musico. So Musico is um, a very different kind of story uh, on paper. It's, it's about my own personal experience of having an abortion and finding through my Japanese heritage this ritual called musical kuyo, which is this, this Buddhist ritual of mourning that allows people to grieve their abortions. Um, and so I'm just gonna show the trailer now to give you a sense of what that looks like. So that was a short trailer. Um, Caitlin and I wanted to make this film because abortion is a very obviously controversial topic in the US. And um, for me, when I found out about this Buddhist ritual that exists in Japan, I was really struck by this, you know, amidst all of the fighting and the politics surrounding such a controversial issue, here was this space where you could breathe um, and you could physically sort of create um, a statue that represents the lost life. And it seems so um, insane to me that that's not even something that's considered in the US. People, people aren't even thinking about the process of grief. They're just sort of thinking about it in terms of a political standpoint. Um, so that's where, you know, we finished this film and a few months later, Daphne reaches out um, just through the miracle of how she found me through various connections. Uh, but she reached out about this book. And, you know, I, I coming from a uh, place where, you know, I don't have any family members who are Holocaust survivors. Um, I never thought I would be making a film on the topic of the Holocaust um, because it didn't necessarily feel like my story to tell. But Daphne comes to me with this project and I know that I get to you know, work in close collaboration with her to, to make this. Um, and then on top of all of that, it seemed really closely um, connected to Musico in a really unexpected way because this is a book that's about creating spaces to breathe. Um, and, you know, I the topic of today's meeting is moving memories and I've kind of taken it upon myself to think about what that could mean in different ways. Um, you know, moving memories could mean memories that are emotionally moving. It could be something that, um, you know, interpreting how we might look at these memories that have been compiled from the Holocaust and be moved by them. Um, but for me, I really think about how the process of, of Daphne making this book was quite literally rearranging these memories that she found that she had hidden away in a drawer in her house for so many years. Um, she was able to, you know, take memories that were pushed away because they were so painful, rearrange them and make them whole again. Um, 
And I was just, I was really moved by that. I, it was really amazing to me that she created this book. Um, and I think anyone who reads it will be able to, to feel that, um, feel the power of that. And, you know, Barbara mentioned at the beginning of this presentation um, that the book doesn't really feel like a conventional book. It doesn't just feel like a piece of text. It feels like an, an object. And that's something I've really felt since reading it as well, that I haven't, I haven't really been able to define what this book is. It's not just a book, it's something much more than that. Um, and I think, you know, making a short film out of a book that's so in depth and beautiful is gonna be a challenge, but it's, it's a challenge that was really exciting to us. Um, so I'm going to let Caitlin uh, talk a little bit more about the process uh, and sort of the early stages of how we started this film. So when Daphne came to us with this book, I think we knew pretty early on that we wanted to create a mixed media film that combines animation and archival footage, since there are so many beautiful images and objects that are in the book already. Um, so we wanted to use those, use these and combine these to kind of create a kaleidoscope of all of the family members' stories. So over the last few months, we have edited Daphne's 80,000 word book down to a 15 page script for a short film. Um, similar to the book, we will have all of the family members' stories interwoven until they go into hiding. However, during hiding, we plan to only focus on Miriam's story. And this part of the film will slow down and visually change and we kind of, want the viewer to experience the feeling of isolation and the way time extends and slows down and also experience the feeling of not knowing how the other family members are doing during this time. So we chose Miriam to focus for this portion because we wanted to uh, see it from the honest and sometimes innocent perspective of a child and to also have this direct connection to Daphne as it's she's her mother. Once the war is over, the voices will once again be interwoven. Uh, but visually will not be the same as the beginning. Those ties that existed before the war are maybe broken forever because even with the survivors surviving, even with the reuniting of the family members who come back together and form new love and new families and with life moving on after the war, these are almost new people entirely after what they went through. So there is a, a break that remains broken. Um, the entire film we plan on telling in the present tense and using age appropriate voice actors and also maybe some non-actors to read for each person. We want the viewers to be fully immersed in the emotions of each family member at the time of their experiences, rather than looking back and reflecting on what had happened. Um, so now we will show some initial visual ideas for the film. It's still very early on, so it's not necessarily what will finally be seen in the end, but Kira can talk a little bit more about the the initial ideas here. Yeah, so um, part of why I was really struck by um, the process of not only the book itself, but the process that went into making this book was, um, you know, all of all of the, the archival materials that came out in order to make this book were stuffed away in this drawer um, Caitlin, if you could sort of skip to the next, I'll go back to the drawing part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so all of the, um, all of these memories were, were in this drawer for many, many years, untouched and unseen, and Daphne took all of them out and one by one went through this huge pile um, in order to, in order to, you know, put together this puzzle, as she said, to make sense of it. Um, and so we really want to show that through um, animation and through, uh, you know, manipulating these archival pieces uh, on screen and showing how they were able to come together um, and, you know, really make use of the fact that we have so much to work with. We have so many physical objects um, to work with. And, uh, so if you could go back to the, the um, visual section. 
Um, so we're going to be using animation, um, stop motion animation to show all of these materials sort of moving and coming together. And um, we're also going to, going to have sort of traditional hand-drawn animation. And for this, we are really inspired by um, Dutch artists, uh, which would be really appropriate for the backdrop and the sort of location of this film. Um, you know, they have, there are these really beautiful sort of etched drawings um, that have a lot of sort of scratch, scratching lines. And we, we want to show sort of those, those lines, um, you know, kind of coming in and out of abstraction to show, you know, kind of how these memories um, are on the verge of being kind of hidden away and coming back into focus again. Um, we go to the next slide. Um, so as I said earlier, that's, you know, we have all of these sort of natural textures and photographs and um, even sort of the wallpaper on the drawer that Daphne uh, found all these, these archival materials and we want to really use all of those real textures uh, in our film and capture that as well. If we go to the last slide. Um, and we're going to be uh, making, so, so this is the wallpaper, sort of the, the paper that was lining the drawer. Um, and it's beautifully in, in Daphne's book as well, um, in the opening flap, the closing flap of the book. Um, so we want to use textures like that and to, to really sort of let the audience feel um, what it was like for Daphne to be able to, to find all of these beautiful memories and um, forgotten memories uh, and to, to sort of bring that out into the open again. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, we're still really early in the process. We don't have, um, we haven't started production or animation yet, um, but that's going to start in the coming months and we're really excited to show our film to you when it's done. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Kira and Caitlin. These are two very, very different approaches to filmmaking. Um, I'll just make a couple of, of comments and then I believe our hour is up. And I, I don't think we'll have, uh, perhaps we'll have time for one or two questions. Uh, but I just, I wanna, I wanna reflect on uh, these two different approaches and what they can offer. I'm struck, I'm struck in the case of uh, Kira and Caitlin's project that they will narrate in the present tense. And I find that very, very powerful. And it's a way of giving to the archival material or restoring to the, to the archival material the, their quality as in real time. Um, and that is, I think that is, uh, I think I mean, we should just think, I think of it as being in the first person and in the historical present and a way of communicating that doesn't um, foretell what will happen later, but stays in the moment of the document, in the moment of the photograph. And I think that that is probably the reason why you don't do what Carmen does, which is to have people today remembering what happened before. So it's, it's a, it, a kind of in real time, on the spot, um, letting the archival material restore a sense of its presentness and not only its pastness. And I think that that, um, uh, I think that's really a very, very interesting approach. And I have a lot more we could say about it. And then for Carmen, I think that there's a very big message in, in Carmen's film, which is about collective responsibility, about responsibility that one has for others. And, it, and I think that, you know, when Carmen said, that, uh, you know, referred to the pandemic and to the issues of vaccination and, um, and the inappropriate comparisons with the Holocaust, I think that it's actually an extremely interesting moment to be making this film and to be um, in a way um, providing a very powerful story um, as a way of showing how inappropriate the analogy is and how I would say dangerous it is to be so preoccupied with one's own so-called personal freedom without any regard to one's responsibility 
to others. So I, I think that you know, when you expressed that, I, it really, really resonated with me. So I think we've come to the end of the hour, and I would ask Nadine if we have time for one or two questions or whether we have to conclude. There's definitely time for one or two questions. Actually, um, there's one question actually for Daphne about if you're related to uh, Berta Geisner. No. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there's another question that I'm not quite sure what it's connected to. Uh, maybe it's connected to what uh, Kira and uh, Kitten were talking about. What was the purpose of putting the names of colors on the sketch of the street and houses in Holland? Was that something in your... We, we had a color palette, which was separate palette, exactly. yeah, from the sketches, but those colors were just taken from some of the uh, archival materials that Daphne had and some things that are in the book. So right. that's just kind of to give an idea of what, it, what the film will look like. Also, someone asked where the archival material was from, and I think that you answered that when, and also showed it in the visuals that we're talking about these Holocaust drawers that were found uh, by Daphne and also by her cousins. And so I think that's something that if someone is interested in learning more about that, you can go back to the first uh, program, Holocaust Drawers, that was in October, and you can find that um, on our YouTube channel. Um, oh, someone, is, uh, someone is asking a question, who's the intended audience for the films? And I think that's also a very important question. That's actually, um, I guess, for both, uh, movies, who would be the audience that you're trying to, I think Carmen started talking about that, but uh, who would be your audience for your films? So that's one question directed towards the filmmakers. For Invisible Years, I can speak on that, uh, our intended audience is mostly going to be teenagers and young adults, um, and I would say mostly people in the US, but we do want it to kind of appeal to people all over the world. And Carmen? And I have a, a little bit of a smaller audience because it's uh, broadcast on Dutch uh, national TV. Uh, and um, it's mostly like a, a little bit of older populations population mm. but i hope that uh fragments of the film parts of the film can be shown on, on schools or uh in the church at the exhibition so that we also can reach out to the younger generations yes i would just add that um i think it's really important to reach out to the younger generations and i'm delighted that carmen's film will be shown at the church to educational groups and schools. And um, I'm really delighted that Kira and Caitlin are making this film because um, I think um, their thoughtfulness and message and style is going to connect with younger people. And um, there's really an urgent need for Holocaust education in the United States, only 19 out of the um, 50 states um, require Holocaust education and 22% of young adults, according to the claims conference um, survey, have never heard of the Holocaust. So um, we are working to do educational programs with the book and the material. And I think um, the film I'm working on with Karen Caitlin is also, it's gonna be standalone, but just a great 15 minute opener to um, educational programming. Okay, Barbara, any last words before we close? No, just uh, uh, what I'd like to say is, first of all, I want to congratulate Daphne on an absolutely phenomenal project. And I think that um, it will inspire other projects, I'm sure, in one medium or another. I think that it could inspire two such different film projects mm -hmm. is itself a real tribute to her book, which is... Um, and if, if those of you who have not seen it, I, I highly recommend it. It's a very unusual, very, very special book. As I said at the very outset, it's, it's really a kind of artifact or object, a kind of work of art in its own way. And I think that's why it, it's been so inspiring. And I just want to wish the two um, sets of filmmakers every success with your films. I very much look forward to seeing them. 
Carmen, maybe we'll be lucky enough to have English subtitles and then your film will travel well beyond uh, the Netherlands. And I think that uh, Caitlin and Kira, your experimental approach shows tremendous promise and very interesting. It raises a lot of issues too, which I'm sorry you didn't have the time to discuss, but I'm sure that once you've made it, um, it will inspire some really interesting conversations. So I thank you both and I wish all of you uh, continued success. And uh, thank you, Maydeen, for making this possible. Absolutely, and thank you all. Um, I just wanna say on behalf of the Ghetto Fighters House, and our CEO, Igal Cohen, and all our partners. I would like to thank our guests today and the Dezute family descendants, Sharon Strauss, Hadassah Lulav, as well as Judith, if she's in the audience today, her mother, Hadassah's mother and daughter of Fifi and Chaim Dezute. And last but not least, Daphne Geismer. We're all an incredible example of passing on the legacy from generation to generation. Their family story of survival and loss has now reached thousands of people and will continue to make an indelible mark on the hearts and minds of many, including mine. 